Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere here in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. In this session of a series called Sensing the New Myth, this is the third of the series, we are joined by Michael Mead. Michael is a mythologist, an author, a storyteller, and he hosts a podcast called Living Myth Podcast, among other series that you'll be able to learn more about at the end of this session. And this has been an essential part of my sense-making diet to have the mythic lens and the storytelling um, perspective on what is happening in the world right now, and the meta crisis and the upheaval and the what Michael might describe as the uh, collective initiation that humanity is going through. And so I feel very grateful uh, that Michael is here with us today. This is special to me, uh, very meaningful. And I'm just excited to be here with you all. Appreciate you all being here. The session will go uh, until the end of the hour. And then there will be a um, 30 minute sense-making practice for anyone who wishes to stay um, that I will be facilitating. So if you wanna stick around, we'll do some breakout rooms and a collective dialogue to continue the conversation um, amongst ourselves. So, welcome, Michael. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you. All right. I'm going to start us off um, with why I have uh, been so enthusiastic about Michael being here at the STOA. And with all of us working on so many different projects and having different passions, one of the golden threads that I see between us all is this return to communitas, a deeper sense of community. And in one of Michael's recent podcasts, he said, we are being called to awaken the soul of humanity and reweave the bonds of communitas. And that really resonated with me and with what I think it is that I'm doing here at the Stowe with some of you and in our individual projects as well. And so my question and what I'm curious about, Michael, is how does communitas uh, support and how and what to what extent is it necessary for the discovery of and the expression of personal genius or to what extent is that discovery like a lone wolf hero's journey and and then also relating that to the idea that um, when enough of us awaken to this genius how that supports the collective initiation so I'm sort of wanting to tie these ideas of personal genius communitas and collective initiation together as a somewhat of a compass for me and my pursuits of designing for communitas and how to to do that um, with wisdom and direction so that is um where my inquiry is aiming and if that um, makes sense to you i'd love to to hear you speak about that okay thank you so welcome everyone um genius to me i've redefined genius the common sense of genius is high IQ or specific rare talent. But the word genius from the Latin means the spirit that's already there. So it's the spirit that's there inside each person born. And the old idea would be that that spirit, that seed of genius is in the soul. So the idea is each person comes in, each person like each tree in the forest, is unique and inside the soul of that unique person is the spirit of genius trying waiting to awaken and so um i distinguish genius from um talent talent is a part of genius talent is a an old german word for the weight used to measure gold so that tells me that if a person doesn't express their talent it becomes a weight on their soul. Um, and so talent is part of it, but not the whole of it. Other capacities are involved and also distinct ways of feeling erotically connected to the world are part of the genius kind of core. Um, but another thing that I think is really important is each genius has its own style so that 
if you're interested in a certain kind of music, you'll soon start to s select out, oh, that's how so-and-so plays. That's how so-and-so plays. They can play the same instrument, but they play it with their style. So style is not a fashion word. Style goes back to the Latin word stylus, something that is engraved. And so a person's style is really something engraved, or you could say written on their soul. And awakening to that style gives a person their entry points into life. Um, so to me, genius is present in everyone born. And, and as a result, it's more pertinent to me than heroics. So the hero's journey comes from the uh, early book by Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in the book, he calls the hero's myth, the monomyth, the only story. And I really disagree. I wrote a book called The Genius Myth, saying that whereas the hero is, tends to be aggressive, masculine, muscular, and aimed at an outer thing, uh, the genius is something already in everybody, regardless of its uh, male or female or any kind of gender orientation, any kind of ethnic background, everyone has it. So that to me seems more important. And where it relates to the meta crises, as you called it, is, so the way I look at that is the biggest crisis in the world right now is uh, global climate change because it affects all the ecosystems, all the living beings, the waters and the entire earth. And then right below that now, we have the coronavirus pandemic, which, so you have a, an ecological crisis. And then below it, we have the pandemic, which is like really a humanitarian crisis that has to do with health. And now it has its own economic crisis. And, uh, but it's, it's really at the humanitarian level. And then the third major crisis right now, I think, uh, was the death of George Floyd uh, being uh, deprived of the life, uh, life breath right in front of everybody uh, as a actual thing and as a symbol of racial injustice, but all kinds of other uh, oppressions in the world so that the death of that one person spread throughout the world and is still affecting people's uh, passions and ideas about injustice. And so it's as if we're in this cascade of crises. And each one of them is complex. Each has its own history. Um, and each has a mystery in it, in, in a sense, as well. So my sense is heroic activities have kind of gotten us in the trouble we're in. And the only way I see getting out is if there's a greater awakening of all the diverse, unique geniuses inside as many people as possible. Because when a person awakens to, the, to their genius, they also get an orientation into life. Um, uh, in other words, some people are already carrying inside, you could say before birth, uh, some capacity to work in nature, to work with forests, the re rebuilding of forests, while so someone else has more of a natural capacity for hospice work, and someone else has a capacity to work on vaccines, and someone else has a capacity for pediatrics and helping children. And so it's all of those things operating at the same time at a more awakened level that would give us the capacity to take on all the complexities of all the levels of crisis. So that's, that's how I see that going together. Um, and then for me, um, this idea of genius, latent genius, uh, is connected to the notion of calling. And so, you know, the, the two different roads you could say into the world are career, which is usually either chosen by someone else or chosen under some more superficial uh, level of decision and then calling a vocation where it's not us choosing, we are chosen. And to me, that's the deeper, richer thing. It used to be called the second adventure of life. The first adventure, as we say in the modern world, is get a life. The second adventure is respond to the call. And the call is calling to the genius that's already there. The call isn't simply going out and finding the treasure or the, you know, whatever it might be that a person is looking for, the knowledge. The call is calling to the genius that's already inside. 
And the genius already knows the nature of itself and the nature of its work. So that there's the old idea was everybody also has a library inside them with all the knowledge that they're looking for. Uh, not that we don't have to go out into the world because we have to be a person of our times and we have to feel the marketplace and the struggles of life. But uh, at the same time, there's knowledge inside trying to awaken. And so the old way of um, helping young people into this state of awakening, which would be self-revelation on one hand, and then also some healing on the other hand. And that would be done through the process of initiation or rites of passage, which at one time would have existed all around the world. And then I call that an archetypal arrangement. I also think that the dynamic underneath transformation is rite of passage. And I'll say something about that shape in a minute. But uh, so what would happen in theory is a young person, girl, boy, whomever it is, uh, would at a certain age go into an artful ritual process, which would be aimed at several things. One, awakening the soul with its genius, with its kind of natural inclinations, with its calling. And, and then on the other hand, repeating, uh, everyone gets wounded. Um, some people deny it but most people are wounded in childhood. Everybody experiences abandonment and everybody experiences some sense of wound. And part of the idea is if we got everything we wanted through the family at home, we would never leave. We'd all remain children. Something is missing and usually some wound has been given and that drives people out into the world. But the, the rite of passage would be the uh, kind of elaborate, artful, um, deep, uh, awakening process between leaving childhood and entering the world. So that when a person enters the world, they're no longer a child, they're a more awakened version of themselves. And part of that would be some healing of early life wounds. So that a person would learn about their own wounds, they would learn about the process of healing, and if they wound up in a position of power, they would have compassion for others because they would understand woundedness and they would understand the need for healing, especially in times like this. So I'm calling the rites of passage the underlying dynamic of transformation. And in, classically, there's three steps. The first step is separation. The second one is transition, also called the liminal period. And the third one is a return uh, to community, but at a new level of understanding um, and acceptance by a conscious community. That would be a successful rite of passage. So what I'm saying is, literally, we are now all separated. Pe many people are in quarantine or partial quarantine. We are socially distanced separated. Um, we're not able to have social gatherings. A lot of people have lost their jobs. There's been a breakdown of all the institutional, functional ways that people socialize, and, and we're more separate as a result. Yes, we're on Zoom all the time, but that's only a partial thing. So we're literally in separation. And so my sense of things, kind of mythic story view, is once something happens like that, the soul thinks we're in an initiation. The soul is this ancient and immediate thing that has this, these old memories of human imagination. And so I think the soul thinks, oh, they're doing initiation again because they're all separate. Uh, then the second stage uh, is called transition. So you're moving from one form through a transition to another form, whether it's the individual or the collective. But I like the idea that that in-between stage, the uh, betwixt and between is liminal. Liminal comes from the old Latin word limen, which is the base of a doorway, the threshold. And, and so that it means you go from one space onto the threshold, then into the next space. So we're in a threshold condition or a liminal condition. And, and liminality includes the breakdown of structures, the loss of patterns, and, and the and opening up at a very deep level, level to unusual opportunities, but more immediately opening up to uncertainty and the need to face the unknown. And so that, that's called liminal. Then you could say, um, if you're on the threshold or the limen, 
The nearby word is subliminal, which means below the threshold, someone, something's trying to come up. So if you accept the idea that we're in this uncertain liminal betwixt and between condition, there's a suggestion that what we're looking for is not the next strategic plan to get us back into the world as it was, but actually something from the unconscious or the unseen that's trying to enter us and can only do so when the institutions rattle and the structures are lucid. So on one hand, we're in terrible crises that have to be faced. On the other hand, we're on the threshold or the verge of finding the next view of the world. So in the middle ground, the way I imagine it, on one hand, you have this liminality and uncertainty, and right next to it, you have a greater opportunity for communitas. Communitas being deep community. Something happens that's so deep and so meaningful, it pulls people together uh, without even the opportunity to figure out what their differences are. The differences kind of melt away because the deep soul becomes so activated. And there's lots of ways to imagine that. Um, one way I saw it recently is in watching uh, the protests uh, of Black Lives Matter and those few moments where there's a conversation between the police and the protesters and something happens and they all kneel down. And that's communitas in the middle of all the commotion with smoke burning in the building behind them with everything undecided and no one knows what's going on. They find a moment to kneel and come to the ground together. That's the deep ground of communitas. So it can happen in a moment and it happens in unexpected and surprising ways. And so my understanding is from those two things, suffering through the liminality, the betwixt them between the uncertainty, the radical changes, and finding moments of deep humanity, deep communitas for the individual, but possibly for the group as well, that creates the energy and opens the imagination to get the ideas and the images for the next world. And so then you arrive at the end of the big transition and everything and everyone has changed. And then you begin the process over again. That's the frame I'm using to understand uh, what we're in. And uh, one other thing I should add, if uh, when there's a rite of passage, um, or you can also call it initiation, which means initiate means to step in, to begin, uh, to begin again and again, really. But uh, there's always a brush with death. There's something that feels like life and death. And so that's because the background idea, and you could say the mystery behind creation is life, death, renewal. In terms of a personal initiation, it's birth, death, rebirth. So I'm using a very old idea that says this whole thing with all its crises, nature, the cosmos, the individual psyche, all participating in life, death, renewal. And so part of the liminal space and the middle ground is the death of things. Uh, like recently here in the United States, people decided to try and go back, some people, to try and go back to normal as they call it. Um, and it just didn't work. It created more abnormal. So. Once the rite of passage is underway, once the initiation is underway, there's no going back. And the only thing is to go forward. Um, and the other thing I would just say maybe to bring it to a close is initiation takes us further and deeper into something than we would choose to go on our own. It has to have that feeling of letting go, I don't know what's going on, and a sense of submission to the adventure. And so I think that has happened collectively to everyone now. We're way further into things than we would have chosen to go. People would regulate it more. We're already in radical circumstances. And uh, so I'm suggesting these old ideas are ways to shape or hold some shape while everything is trying to change. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, please guys drop your questions in the chat there and then I will call on you to unmute and ask your question. I will ask one question and then go to that. Um, 
one thing we're doing here at the SOA, Michael, is developing an ecology of practices and experimenting with different life practices and psychotechnologies we can engage in as a community to develop sovereignty and resilience and communitas and um, in this liminal space. And so I'm wondering um, of what comes up for you as some like essential life practices for developing sovereignty and communitas. Um, yeah, that we might get, that we might experiment with um, or even repurpose for the current moment. So um, in mythological terms, there's two main roads of practice. And one is the contemplative road. Nowadays in uh, many Western cultures now, you have meditation, Eastern style, and you have yoga, which is also has a contemplative component to it. Um, so one road has always been contemplation and meditation. And you find that amongst the original uh, Greek philosophers also. They had their practices of contemplation. Uh, and then the other road has always been expressive arts. So one is the turning in and quieting down and removing from the dynamics of life. And the other is the jumping in and the fully expressing into the dynamics of life. Those are the two roads. And so part of the experiment is to figure out which road a person uh, most likely goes on. Um, I'm on the expressive side. I have the Irish uh, gift or curse of gab. And I'm going to talk at length about almost anything and tell stories and so on like that. And, and that's really a natural practice that lines up with, you know, what's inside me trying to come out. Uh, but uh, because I write, I go into a very contemplative practice when I'm writing. I don't see anyone. I just see words <laughs> and work with that. And so my understanding is in the course of life, a person's going to have to learn a series of practices because the psyche changes and what was maybe primarily uh, meditative suddenly now has to get more expressive in order to find balance and keep uh, the psyche growing. And so at least that's a way to begin. So one more idea, because if you follow the idea of a core genius waiting to unfold, then there are going to be certain practices that are natural to a person. And, um, and so, well, there's lots of ways to get into that, but certain people will find the inclination to music, whereas someone will find the inclination to, they want to be in nature all the time. Well, that becomes a practice. In the ancient world, that was a practice. And so uh, maybe that's a starting way to think about it. Thank you. Rain, will you ask your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Michael. Thanks for being here. Hi. Um, my question is effectively about the ontology of this genius. Um, in the, the, I hear an implicit individuality in it, in a way, like that genius comes from the soul. Um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but uh, I'd love to hear kind of how you, how you see individuality and is, is this genius you talk about an individual property or a collective property or some negotiation between the two? Thank you. Great question. So I see genius as part of the, the uniqueness of a person. So one of the old ideas is the uniqueness of the soul. Each person born is unique from anyone else. Maybe similar people, but never that person. And part of the uh, salvation of one's inner troubles is learning to be with and express one's uniqueness. It's the essential for any kind of expressive art, but even, I think, for meaningful intellectual work. So I think it's something unique to the person. Now, the genius needs to be received by the community or else it backfires, it backs up. So the community becomes 
the receiving part for the genius of the individual people. Um, and then the individual people's genius is the ongoing inspiration and imagination of the community. So there's a relationship between the two. If you think of the genius as gifted, um, the talents as gifts and other capacities as gifts to be given so that you can imagine a, um, instead of a consumer society, a gift giving society, where everybody has helped to give their gifts and the community is the beneficiary of the gifts. Um, but then there's an old idea that when you give from the genius, um, you don't get less genius, you get more. That giving from the genius intensifies and elaborates the capacity of the genius. I mean, that's one way that I think about it. Um, and I should say in classic terms and in mythology, the genius is not human. It's a spirit. And so there's a negotiation between the host of the genius and the genius. For instance, I have friends who are painters and you know they always want to have the next big gallery show. And when they have the show, they're painting right up to the last minute. You know, People are saying, stop, stop. No, I gotta get one more painting up there. Well, that's not the person, that's the genius. The genius doesn't care about the body or anything like that. The genius just wants expression. So my understanding of the genius, it's a spirit that we have to negotiate with. Uh, and it's something that transcends the personal um, and certainly cannot be contained or defined by the communal. The genius is defiant against restriction. Thank you. Chris, will you ask your question? Hi, Michael. Um, I've been reading uh, Thomas Singer, Jungian analyst, uh, his characterization of um, cultural complexes. And uh, I was struck by how he says that cultural complexes get um, momentum. And we're in the middle of a really strong cultural complex. And he says they don't stop until there's a force greater than a complex. Um, what do you think that force may be? Um, and it makes me somewhat pessimistic because I think it won't be a, a positive force. Um, what are your thoughts? Hey, Chris. Good question. Thank you. Um, so I love that idea of the collective or complex. So here's one way I'm seeing it, just to take an example. Um, uh, the United States is suffering under uh, an exacerbated complex of narcissism, having elected Donald Trump, who is an arch narcissist to a place of high power which is the kind of thing no one should ever do because the narcissist can't help but turn everything to themselves and then undermine themselves as well as anything else, everything else. And so this has now been uh, someone with, with really radical narcissistic uh, complications is now in the seat of great power. And so everything is endangered and um, I've been suggesting that there's another thing about narcissism. Narcissistic people uh, can put a spell on other people. Uh, people think that they're being, receiving attention from the narcissist, but the narcissist is really putting them under what in stories would be called a spell. So that people begin acting out the things that the narcissistic person wants. This happens in families a lot. So if you take that configuration, and you say, what's the force that could counteract that? I would say truth. I would say truth. That, tr that the, the narcissistic complex distorts reality. And so what's needed is truth. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think it's, and, and in saying truth, I'm thinking of the old idea of satyagraha, uh, the force of truth. That's what Gandhi called it when he walked across, across India to pick up some salt 
And that was the movement that broke uh, the British Raj, really, broke down because of the fourth of truth, force of truth. And he called it Satyagraha. So it's not truth on a scientific level, per se, and it's not truth in an agreed upon understanding of culture. It's a, it's a penetrating, transcendent truth. Gandhi went against the law because the law was you could not take salt. The salt was owned by the uh, British East India Company, and any person who took salt was violating the law. Well, salt is a necessity for life. And Gandhi understood that. And he understood that he had to go and break that law and said, salt is part uh, of what anybody needs to live. And I'm breaking the law on the basis of that truth. And that brought down the British Raj. So I think there's a need for the force of truth. That's how I would see it. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe, will you ask your question? Hi, thanks Michael for being here. Um, something that uh, kind of stood out to me in your introduction was this talk about having like a brush with that, like being pushed past what you would be willing to go through yourself if you were just having to choose it in that moment. And I was wondering um, how you see like altered states of consciousness as being connected to initiation rites and other transformative events like that? Great question, thank you. So um, if I was gonna study initiation and uh, alternate states of reality, I would go specifically to shamanic initiations. Um, and well, you could also go to Vision Quest. Vision Quest is a pretty easy place to go uh, because they're still being done in the United States as kind of a revival. And, and the basic idea is you separate from everybody and you go and sit in the circle that you've made on some ridge somewhere, no food, maybe a little bit of water, nothing else, exposed to nature. But all the ancient people saw nature as spirit with a green garment on. And so you're really being exposed to the alternative spirit of nature. And, and then the idea is nature, spirit, whatever you want to call it, is going to bring you something that's going to turn out to be a totem animal kind of way of understanding your psyche or some other experience that alters and, and breaks through uh, all common expectation so that there is a personal experience or personal spiritual experience. It's not religious because there's no church involved and there's no doctrine. It's actually the individual opening now, if you want to go back through the tribal groups, you're not just opening to nature because nature is part of the cosmic system or the cosmos. And so it's really the individual opening to spirit, to nature, and to the cosmos. And that calls it, causes a transcendence, a natural transcendence, and the person is never the same. So that would be one way to go. Then you have shamanic initiation, which is uh, uh, you start the study of that in Siberia. The word shaman is a Siberian word. And this is interesting because that happens when a person breaks down. So in the, in the, right, in the vision quest, you're, you're going seeking the vision. In the shamanic thing, it could be you have a nervous breakdown. And then the people say, oh, well, she's broken down now. So I guess maybe she wants to be a shaman. So you then go into a whole bunch of wild experiences. And the core idea is that you die by dismemberment. So you can see how it could align with a, an emotional breakdown or even a, a psychological disorder. Um, because the imagery is that a person is dismembered and then put back together by the spirits um, and put back together in a way that they're different. Often they, the imagery is that they'll put certain crystals at the joints. So the person now doesn't just have uh, bodily joints, sinews. They also have crystals there, as if to say they have been remade through mineral substance. And then they become the people who can, when someone gets lost, which in the ancient world would mean you lost your soul, they have the capacity to go find them because they're now able to... Uh, 
uh, not just communicate, but transit through the other worlds. And so there's a whole field of study there that is anthropological for the most part, but you can see the psychological uh, reverberations of it right away. And so um, if you want to relate it to drug taking, for which people do for vision and for transcending personality and so on, it fits into that shamanic realm where there's going to be something that completely alters the person. Uh, but it's also useful for someone who has had a breakdown. Um, they're separated by that breakdown. They're thrown into an extreme liminal condition. How do they come back? Um, having a diagnosis and getting some drugs, it doesn't bring them back. They're not in community. But if they were understood to be now open to other unusual visions, you bring them back as a visionary. And, uh, and suddenly they now serve a function in this greater sense of communitas. So I hope that's helpful with that. Rhea, will you ask your question? Yes, thank you, Michael, for being here. Um, I feel like this kind of goes along with what you just said. Um, I feel like I personally am going through like a, a, a season of, of death right now, <laughs> kind of like dismantling. And in my experience, many people are uncomfortable or afraid of this idea of dying, even though to me it seems very essential for self-transcendence and then contributing to communitas. Um, so do you have any advice on how to be in right relationship with the concept of death in order for us individually and collectively to step through this threshold to be reborn? Really good question. Thank you. So um, if we're looking at it through the lens of rites of passage, um, and so the rites of passage dynamic starts in youth. And the idea is you don't outgrow childhood. Childhood has to die. That's the old idea. And so there would be a brush with death um, that could be like in the initiation of girls in certain tribes in Africa, um, uh, the, actually girls and young women are initiated individually to begin with. Uh, boys start out as a group and then they try to find their individuality. The girls go when they have their first menses. And, and what is the menses? but blood going through the body and taking out eggs that could have been life that now go in the direction of death. It's so that the beginning of the initiation would be the recognition that the girl is now a woman and as a woman, she knows both life and death inside her body. And then, and then they would, so then you would go out, usually you, you're taken away from the village. It's ha all happens out in nature. Um, and, go into a, a quiet, dark hut and be in darkness for a while. Darkness equates to death, absence, invisibility. Sometimes they would be put in type, inside of a sacred tree that was hollow as if going back into the womb. Um, and that's the same place that all the other women were when they were becoming themselves. And then, so you have this two sides to it. One is death, childhood's over. You'll never be that child again. And, and then the other is embryonic, be like an embryo. And so then the young woman would be inside the tree. And this is an Ndembo tribe in what used to be, well, it's, it's the Congo now. And, uh, and then all the women come and feed her as if she's an embryo. And they give, give her actual food and they tell her all the stories of the feminine and all the things that they know. So she's getting psychological and, and food and ideas and mythological food. Um, and she would be in there for a certain amount of time. And then she would come out of the tree as if she was being born into the world as a new person. And the whole tribe had to come and see the new person. So, so the idea was uh, you have to die to become a new person. Um, and so one way to think about the death is I make a distinction between little d death and big d death. Big d death is like the end of the line. The ropes run out, 
you're going on whether you're somewhere else, whether you like it or not. Little D death, you could call the death of the ego. Something about the ego. In the case of youthful rites of passage, it's the child ego that has to die. Um, the rest of life, we have to have brushes with death that diminish the ego. The ego is a really necessary thing, um, but it is not the center of a person. It thinks it's the center of the person, but it's not. There's a deeper self. And every time the ego can be quieted, the deeper self has a greater chance to, to express and to be present. And so the idea, uh, the, the um, Irish have a proverb, death is the middle of a long life. Or the mystical poet Rumi says, die before you die. So our job is to keep dying because in that we get reborn and we become a bigger, more enlivened version of ourselves. So good for you for being in the season of death. <laughs> Just as long as you're in touch with other people. And <laughs> Wonderful. Ron, will you ask your question? Uh, thanks, Tyson. Hey, Michael, great to have you at the STOA. I actually saw you back in the old days last year in person here in Columbia, Maryland. And okay, great. All just right. got it in under the wire, so it's good to see you again. Uh, I have a, another question about individuation in the collective, and you already kind of addressed this, but maybe I can put a slightly different tilt on it. Uh, I definitely resonate with your any one of your main themes of we're living in an age where individuation and people expressing their genius is what's called for rather than a, you know, a collective political movement or a single idea or ideology or belief system. Uh, and when I preach that, a lot of the pushback I get from others is no, 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 this is an age where the collective is called for more than at any other time. And we really need to lead with the collective and find ways to come uh, together with some collective you know, they may not use the word ideology, but they're kind of pointing to that. So I'm wondering, how, how do you talk about individuation in terms of the collective? And I, I know it's a tricky thing because it's hard. It's almost like a circular thing because people expressing their genius will be doing collective things and forming a, a communitas, as you said. So it's always hard, kind of hard to talk about in, in trying to make this point. So I'm wondering how you see those, those two. I'm really familiar with uh, that conversation. Um, so my way of understanding that is um, that the two are not opposed. That's a misunderstanding. Um, so I would start with the idea, no change at the level of the individual soul, no change in the world. So I'm, I'm saying, mm, it's really complicated, but mythologically, each soul is connected to the soul of the world. The old idea was anima mundi, the world is alive and it has its own soul. And we each have our own soul. And there's a secret connection from the individual soul to the soul of the world. So when there's an, a gr greater awakening of individual souls, it generates the energy and the ideas and images for changing the collective and even changing the world. Um, and so to me, for instance, there cannot be a single idea or an ideology. To me, ideology is what you get when you've lost your imagination. That's what I think. Ideology is not a high level of awareness as far as I'm concerned. So there's no ideology. There's no new political party. There's no single thing now. The problems are too big, too complicated, too historically driven that it has to become a very complex response. And so then the way, and I grew up in the 60s and was part of the collective revolution where, where we thought politics could do a lot and it really didn't come all the way through. And the same issues that were there then are back now with a vengeance and politics is less able now in certain ways. So not that people shouldn't be political and vote for the right folks and do all that stuff. But something else is trying to happen, and it has to happen from the unique souls of people, and then that movement into the world from that inner uniqueness is what changes the world. And so, for instance, um, in the United States, we have some people in 
uh, high positions of authority in states and in the federal government that just should not be there. They don't have the awakened sense of humanity. They don't, in some cases, have any empathy. Some of them lack sympathy. And so, therefore, they cannot act in the interest of the collective. They just can't. So what that tells me is that some people are going to have to wake up uh, and become more conscious of their own capacity to be a leader in the collective political sense. That would be part of the individual awakening as well. In other words, Martin Luther King, who is a very distinct individual, keeps awakening in the course of his, his political career, but also his earlier religious career, he keeps awakening to greater and greater things until he has the dream of the next world, which at least he can pronounce. And in pronouncing it, he even says, I may not get there. That's the sign of the leader understanding the process. And so um, it seems to me that when individuals awaken, some of them will be natural leaders. They will have the capacity and the aim and the inclination, and they just then have to have the heart break open so that have, they have enough heartfelt sense to use the talents and the skills in a way that benefit everyone else. So I think the dichotomy between um, the, uh, the fascination with a, an ideology or a political movement um, and the uniqueness of the individual and soul is a false dichotomy. I think when enough people awaken, that'll include the awakening of natural leaders. And, 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 and then people will, in India, they called it the Dharma. Actually, the interesting old idea was a Sva Dharma, and it meant the individual Dharma, awakening to the way I am intended to serve the world. And so what would really change politics is people, uh, and it doesn't matter their background or their orientation or anything, it matters their genius. If people had, who had a genius for leading were in positions of power, that would make communitas more possible. So that's my sense of it. Natalia, will you ask your question? Thank you. Hi, Michael. So uh, great to be here. I really admire your work. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the, um, the role of lineage and tradition in this moment and in the process of initiation. So in some of these examples of the liminal rituals you give, it's um, with the shamans and the Ndembu tribe, um, they obviously have this community practice of how to help people through these liminal stages. Um, but obviously today, there's both too many traditions and people are very fractured from them. Um, so I'm wondering, to what extent is it important to have, um, to be initiated through a master or a lineage? And also kind of what happens to lineages and traditions more broadly in a time of kind of a, a collective liminal collapse and transformation? Really good questions. I don't know if I have a really good answer. Uh, so uh, start with an anecdote. So once I was in a car, we were driving uh, three and a half, four hours from the airport to a remote camp. We were going to have this really radical conference. And in the car was an African medicine man with lineage from the tribe, uh, a Buddhist teacher and um, practitioner with absolute lineage way back in. He, he was uh, an American, but had really been trained and initiated in India, um, a radical um, <laughs> activist poet with Native American and Latino background, and a Zen monk who was a, uh, uh, a lineage, lineage car carrier in Japan, and myself. And, uh, it was the Buddhist uh, leader who said, how about, we have three and a half hours, how about we each talk about our lineage? Of course, he was quite comfortable with that because he had a distinct lineage, which he gave the, the description of how he went, got initiated and so on. Then the African tribesman uh, talked about his initiation and, and how that connected to the ancestors and how the ancestors connected to the spirits of nature. 
uh, and then the Zen uh, master gave his description of receiving the cloth of the lineage, which had been passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then the Latino poet activists and I looked at each other and said, what do we say? And so he, good friend of mine, Luis Rodriguez, he, he talked about his lineage in both uh, poetry and in politics, in, in, in activist politics, but also then his lineage by virtue of having uh, both um, uh, Latino blood and his mother was from uh, the, the Taramara, a tribe in Southern Mexico. So he had native tradition and, and Mexican Latino type tradition. And so that's where he went. And then I, I was really happy to be last because I was trying to figure out what's my lineage. And so where I went to, I started naming William Blake, uh, William Butler Yeats, and then and back to the old Irish Shanakis who were the seer storytellers and saying, none of these people do I actually know, but they are my lineage. Because I had to build my lineage because I wasn't part of any tradition per se. And so in a way, that's, those are the options. You know, you can go the route of one of the, um, uh, religious or spiritual practices, and then you can develop lineage that way, or be pulled into a lineage through rituals, which was the case with this, the Zen master. You could be born in a tribe somewhere, and then you'll get lineage. Or if you're, you know, like I call it the outsider, you're outside the current culture, you're outside the traditional culture, you, you then have to find your lineage by virtue of imagination and by virtue of understanding the inner, the inner lines of the self to find lineage. And so in my sense, lineage uh, is a really a large thing. I don't know exactly what happens inside the, um, the lineage groups now and how they deal with all this stuff. Some of the traditions have in the lineage practices, they have a, like a wild card. Like in the Zen tradition, it was Ikiyu is, is called the, the criminal monk. Um, he's part of the tradition, but he did all his meditating in the tavern. And so, but he's included. So they have like a wild card for how you deal with unexpected uh, periods of time. Um, but the other thing I've been working on is uh, the outsider. And so it starts in, in India, which with what some people call the outcasts, but originally they were called the outsiders. And so the idea, idea there is if new ideas, if new imaginations are coming into a culture, they can't come in through the people who see themselves and feel themselves to be in the culture status quo as it is, they come in through the outsiders. And so I think there's a way to reimagine being an outsider in the culture as being a, uh, a point of transmission for knowledge trying to enter the world and as being a messenger. So maybe that's helpful. But that's what I'm working on now is outsiders because we have less structural lineal, linear, lineage processes now in modern cultures. So anyway, I hope that helps. Thank you. This brings up a question that has been really alive for me and in some of my conversations recently, and that is on the cultural appropriation versus what is cultural appreciation. And I'm curious in your, like in your experience with different cultures, um, in, a lot, in my community, there's a lot of desire to participate more fully in some of these rich cultures um, to, to learn from the way that they connect with the arts or with the land. Um, and there's also like a sensitivity of like, oh, am I doing it wrong? Or like, is this, this, this isn't mine, I shouldn't. There's kind of this um, sensitivity around this, um, whatever you might call that, that, that um, this cultural appropriation, um, people cracking down on that. So I'm curious if you have any just perspectives or, or wisdom thoughts you might share around that. It, it's an important question. And it's, a, it's a serious issue. So the first thing that I see, if someone is saying, we don't want you messing with our traditions, then I, that has to be respected. Um, and, 
and maybe there are meeting places like uh, I have a friend who wound up in a a, a, a traditional Buddhist um, temple, but he sat outside in the rain and the cold and and the heat of the sun for days before he got invited in. So sometimes you just have to be nearby and be respectful, and then the door opens. Um, but on the other hand, there are traditional groups that want to give you what they have. Most of West Africa is that way. The tradition is in West Africa is whatever we have was given to us by spirit, we'll give it to you as well. So my first drum teacher was that way. You know, someone actually tried to try to take a drum away from me when I was drumming in this event, and I instinctively held on to it. And then I went back to the teacher and said, well, these people thought that I was a white person playing African music and they would try to take the drum away. And he said, did you give it to him? I said, no, he goes, oh, you're right. He said, no one owns drumming. It was given to me, I gave it to you. If you want to give it away, go ahead. If you don't, then you know, stay on the horse or the drum. So there's one idea. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it's a big thing to study and a person has to be respectful and aware. Uh, in the storytelling tradition, uh, the storytellers, uh, certain kinds of storytellers went between the tribes, went all around. They had passage. And sometimes they wore a cloak of several colors, or they had something, a feather that indicated that they were moving between the lineages and the tribes, because there needs to be communication and cross-pollinization also. Um, but here's an anecdote. I was doing a workshop. And um, up in the Northwest where I, I live, but north of where I am. And, and um, into the back of the room during the workshop came uh, a number of uh, Native people from Lummi Nation. And I've worked at Lummi Nation. I work with their young people, work with their elders. And so they visit if I'm around. Um, and it was right after they got in that I had everybody had been singing a chant from Africa. And then someone got up and asked, are we doing cultural appropriation by singing someone else's song? And I said, well, actually, I have permission to share that song from the tribe, tribal members. Uh, I said, but we have some people from Lummi Nation here. So maybe we should ask them, um, are we doing some kind of cultural appropriation? And they got together and had a talk. And then afterwards, and I was waiting curiously, maybe even uneasily to find out, they, they might say, cut it out, Michael, you, you, you're doing too much of this or something. But then the, one of the aunties, they call them aunties, she's an elder, she stood up and she said, well, we discussed it. And uh, we don't mind cultural appropriation. We don't. What we mind is cultural misappropriation. <laughs> it was a great distinction. And she said, we know that certain people are using traditions to benefit the modern situation, to open people's hearts and minds. And so we judge by what the result is, not by what the premise is. And so we come here because we know what's going to happen here. And, uh, and then they offered a song themselves in their native language. So, so I think the distinction between appropriation and misappropriation is good. And I think the distinction between do people want to, do they want to share or is it something they're preserving? So those are some thoughts. Thank you, that's helpful. Well, that brings us now through the hour. Um, thank you, Michael, for being here. Um, thank you everyone for the really rich questions. Um, Michael, before we finish, is there anything that you would like to leave us with? Uh, yeah, just to say thank you, Tyson. Thank you for everybody um, for really good questions, good thoughts. This is a, an amazing time to be alive. It can be discouraging and disheartening, but it's really, uh, I think, the transition to a greater imagination and a different world view, view that's more inclusive of everybody. And lately, this has been on my mind. This is one of my lineage people, William Blake, who uh, had this statement that I carry around and I notice I'm thinking about it a lot. He said, every day has a moment of eternity waiting for you. In other words, no matter how bad it gets, 
there's going to be a moment where the eternity, the eternal is trying to reach us. And so part of what a practice is about, a practice helps me, helps you align with that moment of eternity more often. So in the midst of all the chaos and all the discouraging things, I'm wishing everybody moments of eternity. Thank you. Well, everybody, if you would like to experience more of Michael's work, you can visit the website here, mosaicvoices.org. And I'll drop one more link for you. Um, the STOA is operating on a gift economy. And if you wish to give a gift to the STOA, you can do so here. And thank you, Michael, for being here. I'm going to facilitate a 30-minute uh, sense-making practice now for anyone who wishes to stick around. If you've got to go, then that's all right. Otherwise, I look forward to continuing this conversation with you. So I'll give it a minute for anyone who has to leave to leave. And if you want to get up and get a glass of water or anything like that, uh, you can do so now. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks, Tyson. Thank you, everybody. Good luck. Be healthy. Be safe.